So I will be talking about religious experience and the unification of the previously divided self on William James and the attachment religion uh, connection. Um, we'll start out by talking about William James' ideas on religious experience, or some of them, um, that we have kind of stumbled upon almost serendipitously when we have been working based on attachment theory in relation to religious experience. Now, James thought that religious experience had the potential to unify the previously divided self. We've stumbled across similar findings from a different theoretical vantage point, but we don't know whether unity is maintained in the long term. Uh, for methodological reasons, so I would like to end by talking about the promise of psychedelic treatment which can optimize the conditions for unity experiences that can be also maintained potentially over time. So William James wrote his great book The Varieties of Religious Experience in 1902 and he distinguished between healthy-minded individuals and sick souls. I will be talking almost exclusively about sick souls now. <laughs> and, and so he said that they can be disti distinguished by the fact that the sick souls have a divided sense of self. I won't be talking about the double self, I will be talking about the divided self today. Uh, whereas healthy-minded individuals tended to have a more unified self. So a divided self can be exemplified, for example, with the self represented as okay and good, but at the same time also inherently bad and sinful. And the person cannot really get these two pieces together. They cannot integrate in the Jungian sense. These people are predisposed to suffering. James discusses guilt, shame, self-doubt, depression, anxiety, even suicidality. Um, he also says that at the peak of their suffering, they may ultimately self-surrender because the futile attempts to regulate stress basically just perpetuate distress. And after some time, the person gives up, cries out. Um, and when they do, they are prone to intense religious experiences when they give up their selves. Um, so he discusses sudden religious conversions and he discusses mystical experiences as, as examples of transformative religious experience. So uh, both of them, and especially mystical experiences, uh, are characterized by Ye James as unity experiences. Um, the self is dissolved, basically, and unified with whatever is interpreted to be on the other end. It can be God, but it can also be a higher self, potentially, or just nature, if you're a nature mysticist. But it has the potential to also unify the previously divided self. And of course, that is marked by great release of tension and happiness. But James also notes that these persons are prone to relapse into suffering uh, in due course. He discusses a number of examples of addicts who they go back to booze after some time and then you know the process starts all over again. He discusses St. Paul, Martin Luther, Leo Tolstoy, um, let's see, Wesley, there are lots of examples. And from his diaries, it's obvious that James considers himself to be one of these six souls also. Um, he wrote approvingly about the promises of psychedelics in these regards, before anyone else did, actually. Um, Mescaline in particular. Um, and James's ideas here have had a long-lasting influence. For example, on the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 steps are more or less designed based on James's uh, ideas. Um, and of course, he has had an influence on psychedelic science as well. So second point I would like to talk about is wor our work on the attachment religion connection. Um, James's ideas are descriptive and uh, they can be said to be a little bit fluffy. They don't come with particular kinds of operationalizations and so forth. So I've been working based on attachment theory, but have continued to just stumble upon Jamesian ideas all the time. Uh, like I said, almost serendipitously. I'll talk 
Just a little bit about our research in this area. If you want to read more, there's this uh, book that I published three years ago in, for an American publisher. It was translated and released in, in Swedish translation earlier this year. So those of you who read Swedish, I would recommend the Swedish book instead because it's updated and it contains sections on psychedelic science that the American book did not contain. It's a late developing interest of mine. Um, so to get into this and to see the relevance in relation to James, we need to start a little bit by individual differences in attachment, um, which is kind of one leg of attachment theory and attachment research. And secure attachment is the most common form uh, of attachment organization in, in children and adults. It's typically described as a primary strategy. The newborn signals its needs in a fairly undistorted fashion, as though expecting that there will be someone on the other end who detects the signals and responds to them in appropriate sensitive ways. When that happens, the primary strategy is retained over time. And it's marked by positive and coherent mental models or what John Bowlby called internal working models of attachment. This, this means basically that the self is assessed as worthy of care and others are assessed as available to provide care when need be. It's interesting to note that this is true both at conscious and unconscious levels of the mind. So Bowlby described this as a singular set of working models where the unconscious parts and the conscious parts point in the same direction. Signal vulnerability if you are vulnerable, for example, don't distort the signal. Um, so that would be the equivalent of a unified mind uh, in James's uh, terminology. Whereas insecure, including disorganized attachment, we typically view as a conditional or secondary strategy that develops if the primary strategy of security fails. Or in the case of disorganized attachment, it can even be a breakdown in strategy. And this is marked by negative and incoherent or divided, to use William James terms, working model, models. So the self is assessed as unworthy of care and others are assessed as unavailable to provide care. And this is especially the case at unconscious, automatic, procedural levels of operation. And often in conflict with what the person consciously thinks and states. So this is plural models according to Bowlby because they go in two different directions. So for example, the person can say, my mother is very loving but if you activate the attachment system of the person, they will avoid the mother. So procedure and declaration goes in opposite directions. That's a divided representation. Right? Bowlby also had some interesting things to say about surrogate attachments. For example, whenever the natural object of attachment behavior is unavailable, the behavior can become directed towards some substitute object pacifiers, blankets, teddy bears, and so forth. And later in development, imaginary friends that David talked about earlier. Um, and insecure attachment is one of the conditions that leads to predisposition to look for surrogate attachment uh, figures to complement uh, one's current attachment figures. Um, these ideas have been influential for something that we have called the compensation pathway to religion, where we basically say that religion and spirituality, in the case of insecure attachment, develops as a response to emotional turmoil or stress that is sufficiently severe to overthrow the insecure individual's conditional strategies. So, for example, rather than avoiding, the individual cries out. And when they cry out, they detect something on the other end, which can be God, for example, uh, as a kind of surrogate figure. We have quite a bit of supportive findings for this. Uh, for example, we've found in a number of studies that insecure attachment is related to religious instability. In particular, um, sudden religious conversion, so intense religious experiences. Um, 
a meta-analysis of sudden conversions is one example. We also know that these individuals, when they experience increases in religiousness, it tends to happen uh, in periods of emotional turmoil. For example, following a romantic relationship breakup. Um, we've also seen um, in one study of my own, which has been replicated in a, in a study in, in California, that attachment disorganization predicts mystical experiences. And that bivariate link is statistically mediated by what Tanya Lurman just talked about, absorption. So this is how it looks statistically. We had unresolved, disorganized loss and abuse. At the first measurement point, three years later, we assessed mystical experiences and we got this fairly modest but still significant correlation. And that literally turned to zero when we included uh, the Telegan absorption scale uh, in a statistical analysis. Do note, though, that disorganized attachment is not uh, linked to conventional aspects of religion, but it is this altered um, spiritual uh, states and experiences. So one of the key questions for, for me and my colleagues in this field has been whether religion and spirituality as compensation uh, might facilitate what we call earned security of attachment, so that the person would go from, say, insecure attachment to secure attachment via a mystical experience or something else that, that belongs to spirituality and religion. This is not inconceivable. We know that psychotherapy can have such effects. We know that other kinds of reparative relationships can have such effects, unless the partner dumps you, <laughs> um, which they may. Um, so. In my book, I discuss quite a bit the limited evidence that is available on this question. Um, uh, and the studies are kind of poor, including my own. So I say maybe, uh, but the evidence is mixed and there are likely multiple qualifiers. Um, and it's hopeless to bring order to qualifiers in naturalistic research. So in other words, what I'm saying is that maybe some people can, can achieve earned security via mystical experiences, but others probably not. And we would need to sort out what conditions uh, that underlie that heterogeneity. So that's, I kind of left this field um, a few years back. I wrote the book because I wanted to close shop uh, on the attachment religion connection. I've been working too much on it. I wasn't enthusiastic about it any, any longer. But it was with some sadness because this key question could not be answered. Wouldn't it be fantastic if one could enable mystical experiences under optimized conditions and study the pertinent processes under controlled experimental conditions? <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, so that's where we get to the promise of psychedelic treatment. Um, some of my colleagues and students, Sebastian is here, um, um, wrote uh, an agenda proposal based on attachment theory and the attachment religion connection to inform research in psychedelic science, in part to be able to address this kind of question. At least for me, that's, uh, that's, that's the key issue, maybe not for my co-authors. Um, this is an old slide. Um, the paper was published 11 months ago or something, and it's already up to 4,500 reads or something. Even though it's very limited empirical data, it made kind of a splash, actually, uh, which is interesting in a way. We discuss in that paper attachment as a predictor of psychedelic experiences, attachment security as a viable outcome of psychedelic therapy, and attachment theory more generally as a framework to understand other uh, aspects of psychedelic processes. I will talk a bit now before closing uh, about the first and second circles here. Attachment as predictor is important because Roland Griffiths, who just passed away about a week ago, by the way, he's, he said a, a few years back that our ability to predict transcendent experience in psychedelic therapy is almost none at all. Um, and this is a very important limitation because transcendent, for example, uh, mystical experiences are often caused by psychedelics. Roughly 70% in the Johns Hopkins studies, 60% according to recent meta-analysis. And it's also 
these kinds of experiences partially mediate the clinical utility of psychedelic treatment. So therefore it's important to know whether people can have these experiences or not. Um, there was only one study available when we wrote the agenda proposal. That's a small pilot study with 18 individuals from San Francisco, um, demoralized AIDS survivors with depression, uh, who took a strong dose of, of psilocybin in the context of group therapy. And they found in that study that insecurity, anxious attachment predicted mystical experiences during the dosing session. Since then, we have two replication and extension studies underway. The first one is the Nysne retreat study with 50 participants, healthy participants, who volunteer to go to the Netherlands to partake in a psychedelic retreat. Um, and we found there as well that insecurity predicted mystical experiences significantly. There is a Jewish psychedelic project that one of my PhD students is doing, um, cross-sectional survey on Jews with psychedelic experience, where we found that perception of an insecure attachment history with parents <coughs> were, was linked to psychedelically induced mystical experiences as well, at a somewhat smaller effect size level, but nonetheless significant. And it was also associated with other facets of psychedelic phenomenology. Um, secondly, earned attachment security as outcome. There is some evidence from the, the, the AIDS study, lower attachment insecurity at three month post therapy follow up. The Nysne study uh, replicated that finding as well with lower attachment insecurity, both avoidance and anxiety, two weeks after the psychedelic retreat. So, just to conclude, this looks promising. Psychedelic treatment may facilitate earned security, perhaps via mystical experiences, or in James's terms, unify the previously divided self. But it's far from definitive as of yet. Very poor methodological control. We didn't have any control groups in these studies. Sole reliance on self-reports, which is a notorious uh, in psychology research. And we have not just analyzed mechanisms of change, so we can't say for sure whether it's mystical experiences or something else that uh, drives these changes. So it calls for more ambitious studies, process-oriented RCTs, for example, with more advanced attachment measures. Many thanks to my local co-workers and to non-local co-workers as well. Thank you all for, for being kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, James, and you say religion unifies the divided self. Yeah. Does the self become more clever to other kinds of attachment apart from attachment to, to a god? Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a, that would be predicted. Yes, absolutely. If a person undergoes <clears throat> earned security, it really, um, the predictable consequence of that is that their attention will be more open. So they will be more responsive, for example, to infants' needs and more sensitive as caregivers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, the healthy minds, they can live on with a divided self. No, they don't. They have a more unified self naturally. Uh, according to William James, that doesn't exclude the possibility that they have a double self in the sense that we've talked about it now. But it's not a conflicted self, right? It's not a defensive uh, maneuver to, to deal with vulnerability, and that's really what I'm talking mm. about. And how can you prevent the relapse in these newborn Christians? Good, good question. Well, I think holding communities are super important, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous are yeah. working with as an example, and so I think that's also part of the psychedelic community is uh, they have a lot of communities where they support each other, basically, and I think that's key to maintain this over time. Hmm? Thank you, and let's delve.